especially the guy sitting on the side of the road. If they're waving at you, you know they're not holding a gun. I first met Sergeant First Class John Braswell on his year-long deployment to Afghanistan with his Alabama National Guard Special Forces Unit in 2002. I work for a software company in the real world, so uh, it's a little bit different. I guess I was a little surprised that they would activate a National Guard Special Forces Battalion almost right at the outset of the conflict. So were his two young sons and wife, Laura. He took a significant pay cut and we were sort of forced to sell our home. Up until that point, we had done two weeks in the summer and one weekend every month. Former Idaho National Guardsman Dan McKnight and Kent Ferns both re-enlisted on 9-11, expecting and anxious for their National Guard units to be sent to Afghanistan. But not as it turned out, multiple tours to both Iraq and Afghanistan the past 20 years. And so I became very disillusioned and I came home confused. Um, I came home injured. I came home broke. I came home to a broken marriage. Idaho National Guard units have been deployed to Afghanistan or Iraq 15 of the last 20 years since 9-11. I expected this all to be over, but in the last 18 to 20 years, it just keeps continuing and, and, it, and the mission for the National Guard needs to be changed. Traditionally, the National Guard has been activated by their states for domestic emergencies like natural disasters, civil disturbances, and the current COVID medical crisis. But they also provide support and backup to the active duty military for overseas operations. Our guys are getting shot up. We need those buildings dropped down. But since 9-11, the National Guard has sent more of its units overseas than it has since World War II, some as frequently as once every three years. In 2005, over half of the troops serving in Iraq were from the National Guard. According to the National Guard Bureau and its operations director, Brigadier General Nick Dusich. In the past 20 years, the major transition has been from a strategic reserve to a combat operationally focused reserve capability. The federal government pays the cost to recruit, train, and equip the state's National Guards. Their commanders and chiefs, the state governors, are constitutionally obligated to make them available in the cases of national security threats. What's at issue here is what's a national security threat? And this is the age of undeclared wars, which every American war has been since World War II. Well, then fine. If it's a real true threat to the United States and our interest, again, as it's stated in our Constitution, then Congress should do their job and they should have a formal declaration of war. Idaho Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan supports legislative initiatives to restrict the use of a state's National Guard in undeclared wars which she believes are not included in Article I of the Constitution, allowing federal use of state militias for executing the laws of the nation, suppressing insurrections, and repelling invasions. It should be difficult to take our state militias and our active duty military into war. Without a con congressional declaration of war, we have no business fighting in these foreign overseas misadventures. And so I don't see it as an anti-war. I see it as a pro-Constitution measure. McKnight, both a former Marine and Army veteran, launched the Defend the Guard initiative with other veterans and politicians from both parties to limit foreign deployments, National Guard troops only to wars formally declared by Congress. The 2001 War on Terror Resolution has allowed the past four presidents to send National Guard troops to fight in Afghanistan and Iraq without a declaration of war. Citizen soldiers were always meant to be the ones that defended America, not a standing army. And so if America needs to go to war, we should do it the right way. Now is the time to push back, to lay claim to our sovereignty as a state. Idaho State Representative Ben Adams, a former Marine and Afghanistan veteran, is trying to get the Defend the Guard initiative passed in Idaho, as are legislators in 30 other states, with little success oh, thus far, in getting it to a vote. There. The state restrictions are highly unlikely because that there's already a Supreme Court decision, Perpich versus the U.S., that date back, dates back to the Reagan administration. Former National Guard Bureau Deputy Chief of Staff, Brigadier General David McGinnis, doesn't believe the states will be able to limit federal control 
of the National Guard. Once the Guard is mobilized for federal service in the context of any law or mobilized for training, federal training, as a reserve of the Army or Air Force, the states have no control over what the president or the Department of Defense does with those units once they're in that status. It's hindered them because they're sometimes gone from their communities uh, in times of real emergency stateside, like the Louisiana National Guard being gone during Katrina, or the Oregon National Guard being pulled off the fires last season in the worst firefighting season in their state history and sent to Afghanistan with the helicopters that they should have been fighting fires with. In the past, people who signed up for the National Guard really weren't thinking about going active duty, or being deployed, or certainly going to war. Has that all changed? It definitely has changed. In the old days, it was uh, uh, join the National Guard to avoid Vietnam. After 9-11, that, to me, that all changed. That it, we were on, in, the, in it to win it and, and to be war fighters and not just the state mission. Now I feel like we need to bring that back. The Idaho National Guard declined our interview request, but sent us its rebuttal for giving the state the option to limit overseas deployments. It included the possibility of cutting federal military funding for not making the state's units available when called on. Why would the federal government pull all that away? It's, it wouldn't make any sense. So, you know, I think it's time to start asserting our sovereignty as states. Governor Brad Little, Commander-in-Chief of Idaho's National Guard, disagrees. He's not willing to risk the loss of over $200 million a year of funding from the National Guard, the state's fourth largest employer. And we're not crying for mercy here. We're not asking that the National Guard be released from this obligation. We're just simply asking that they do it the right way. The president has enough active force, if they're properly organized, to react initially to any situation. And that would give him time to talk and to talk to the congressional leaders and get an authorization from Congress. I don't think there should be an outright restriction, but I do think that they should only use them in, uh, in, uh, in as Pat said, an emergency situation. Long, nearly 20 years since John Braswell was part of the first wave of National Guard troops deployed to Afghanistan, there's general agreement that these combat deployments, constitutional or otherwise, have made the National Guard better trained, equipped, and more integrated with the active duty military than previous weekend warriors. For the PBS NewsHour, this is Mike Suray in Boise, Idaho.